Hi, this is Brandon with Cairo Up, and I want to cover a quick case that happened this month with a uh, case that I failed on. And that case was a patient who was a very sedentary person in their job and in their life and decided, like uh, some of our patients might, that they're going to be a CrossFit athlete and they're going to start running and they're going to do that uh, couch to 5K in the next couple months to lose some weight. And uh, good intentions, and I uh, did a, a pretty good job of uh, designing this program. However, he started to develop this pain in the right sacroiliac joint right in the back part of his buttock, right where the tailbone meets the back. And uh, this is a burning pain that started more acute, and then now when he's doing any kind of activity, especially any kind of a jarring activity like the running or lumbar spine flexion, he starts to feel his pain. There's no pain paresthesia or anything going down into the, the legs. He stays pretty localized. Uh, when he does aggravate it, it stays there for a pretty long time, but then a couple hours, maybe a day later, it goes away. And I go palpate in the area, and he's got a little bit of stiffness and, and pain when I palpate in the iliolumbar ligament, the long uh, posterior sacral ligament, uh, then all the, the musculature associated with that. And uh, I thought, well, I'll do lads, let's test. Uh, we'll look at the four tests for SI joint dysfunction. Your, your SI compression, as we see here, the distraction, sacral thrust, and thigh thrust test. What I know from statistics in my office is that when I see an SI joint dysfunction is that I have usually 100% of them better within four visits in the first 30 days. 100% of them are satisfied with their care and leaving Google reviews on how satisfied they are with my care. It has nothing to do with my technique and how I treat them. I adjust them the same way that you do. Uh, they're just home run cases. Um, and that, that, that's good to have, especially at the end of your day when it's, when it's a long day. Uh, but when we look at the true diagnosis of SI joint dysfunction, there's not a lot of really good studies as far as what are the radiographic signs, what are the best tests to use, uh, what are the best physical examination tests besides those we have from Laslett. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, medical doctors and pain management anesthesiologists will start to do injections in that area to help get those people out of pain. But what I'm seeing with this patient is he's not getting better. It's two weeks, it's three weeks, he's not improving. That's a problem in my office, is that I tell everybody within two weeks you're going to see some kind of improvement, especially SI joint dysfunction. So I send him over to my friends at the hospital. He takes a look at it. He's like, oh, he's got an SI joint problem. Does the same test that I do, except his treatment is now to inject the joint. Stick a needle in the joint, inject a pain reliever, and it should get better, right? That's the gold standard, SI joint you know, uh, injections. Uh, and they also do some radiofrequency ablations uh, in that area to help with symptoms and just numb up those, uh, those posterior rami uh, affecting that joint. Here's the problem, is that even after we did my treatment, which I thought was the best one, we did his treatment, which he thought was the best one, my patient still has his pain. So I dug a little bit deeper. What else could be going on? And uh, I found some interesting papers about medial uh, colonial nerve entrapments and they have the exact same presentation, is that they have that pain that's localized right in the same spot. Uh, Fortin and Falco said it's just one centimeter posterior and medial to the PSIS, so that same area that everybody has their pain, kind of like a shoulder pain when they have pain right here. Uh, it could mean any number of certain things. But the most interesting thing that I found was a paper by Mirakami, and they had 25 patients, and they injected either inside of the joint or they injected around the joint, right where that medial colonial nerve is. And they found that if they injected inside of the joint, about 9 of the 25 got better. Uh, what they found, though, is that they injected around the joint, now they got 100% resolution of pain. So they're numbing the nerves that's causing the pain. That's the main purpose that I want to talk to you about today, is that we have somatic pain and we have neuropathic pain is that I was under the impression we had a somatic pain problem. We had a repetitive stress injury. He was probably turning into a tendinopathy patient. And of course, um, you know, once my treatment wasn't working, I got in there with my grass and instrument and started roughing it up a little bit, which probably doesn't work very well for neuropathic pain. Uh, neither did that injection inside of the joint. Uh, so what we need to recognize is the difference between those two different types of pains, and that's the importance of our classification during our history taking and understanding what is the pain generator because it can make a dramatic difference on your patient. Now, what did I do for this patient? Now that I had to classify, I had a really good idea of what's going on. I stopped being rough on it. I stopped aggravating it with manipulating it and I started doing this. 
So to stress the medial cluneal nerve, what I have the patient do is lay on their side and have the affected side up. They're going to bring this leg into uh, an extended position, and I'm holding her leg. I've got it nice and supported. I can control how much flexion I get out of the hip. And then to give her some support that I'm not going to let her fly off the table, I'm just going to be holding her arm back here uh, just so she feels nice and secure and doesn't need to support her own body weight. What I'm going to have her do is I'll have my hand across the PSIS, uh, as you see here, and as I try to bring her down into a little bit of adduction, she's going to take her hip and push towards the wall behind her. So as she pushes, as she's doing right now, she's holding that, and then I just do a relaxed session, and as she relaxes, I go a little further down, and then she pushes again, seven seconds, let her relax, and we'll go a little further down, push, hold for seven seconds, let it relax and go a little further down. After performing that technique three times, doing some rest and some ice, he started to feel much better. We changed his running technique. We got rid of his crossover gait. Uh, two weeks later, he's out of pain. He's back to uh, destroying his body with uh, uh, poor form during CrossFit, but we can work on that on a different date. Thanks for listening to this blog. Uh, for any other information on where we get our statistics from and all the, uh, the journal articles that we cited in this, uh, visit Kyrope.com.